Hey everyone, this is Greg. Welcome to Patio Slave, episode 85. <laughs> That's beautiful. So Greg is back, Greg Bergdorf. Nice to have you back. This is round four. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's exciting. No, nobody's at four yet for me, except for me. Right? You are the the only person at four now. We do have somebody who's come on three episodes, but it was twice. We had him on. We just split episode uh, the second time into two episodes. So uh, a local local rapper by the name of Spose we've had on the last couple of weeks, uh, a couple weeks back. So yeah, you were the first person to get to four and three for right. that matter. If you want to checkmate that, you just have to talk. We just have to talk for like four hours and you can get like six episodes. <laughs> you get split them in half. <laughs> yeah. uh, I am off tomorrow, so that's fine for me. <laughs> You're uh, taking tomorrow off uh, in case the Red Sox win. You're going to be too hungover. I might, yeah, I might be having a, I might be having a decent evening. Uh, <laughs> watching them right now on my phone as we're doing this because I can't, I can't. If anybody follows us on Twitter, I, I was doing the same thing last night at the Frank Turner show in, at Hampton Beach uh, Casino <laughs> Ballroom. I had the game on, on my phone and the stage right in front of me, so it was <laughs> pretty wild. But yeah, go Sox. Just, just throwing that out there. Who's Frank Turner out with? Uh, Laura Jane Grace and Nathan Gray. And it was awesome. Laura Jane hadn't played a ton. I think I think she said she'd played like maybe one or two shows a month since August. So this might have been the fifth time she's she's played somewhere. And that's the first time I've seen her. So I was pretty pretty stoked. I saw against me back in the day, probably ten years ago, but uh, first time I'd seen her on her own, and she was awesome. And, and obviously Frank put on a great show because that's what he does. Cool, cool. Have you played that yeah, room, I, I didn't... the Hampton Beach Casino in New Hampshire? Is it on a boardwalk? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think I did. Nice. Once. If I remember correctly, if I'm thinking of the right place, our drummer, Ed, flew home for that show or to skip that show because his girlfriend was graduating college and was going to break up with him if he didn't, Will wasn't at her walk. <laughs> oh, wow. And, oh, man. and we had uh, Carlos from Real Big Fish sit in on drums and he like learned the set like, the day before he's like oh, yeah, wow. yeah yeah whatever i'll just play that's amazing <laughs> that's awesome. nice yeah great great room holds like two thousand people it was probably if it wasn't sold out it was damn near close uh and you know everybody was was really into it there were a couple of people that had medical issues unfortunately that kind of stopped things a few times but Ooh. everybody was allowed to do what they needed to the, the crowd was awesome frank was awesome and kind of di directing people what to do from the stage which was probably not something that he does a ton but has done before and it was it was, it was wild it was a good show uh, i'm stoked to be back at live music so uh, it was it was fun yeah awesome did you have to show a, a vaccination card or anything to yep. get in or yeah my wife and i went and, and they uh I think at Frank's request, because New Hampshire has been a little more lax than Maine and California, where, where the rest of us live. And I don't know how it is down where you are, Greg, but it's, it's Georgia, man. They don't care. They don't, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I was there this summer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're right. Uh, but yeah, they did. They had us. Everything that I've been to so far, I've been to th four shows, and three of them have asked for for cards. So yeah. I, I've got a picture of it on my phone. I just, yep, here it is. Ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only state that could care less is Florida. And like my <laughs> yeah. buddy, like in early summer, was like, oh, man, Steel Panther's coming to town. And they already sold out two shows. I was like, oh, really? They're still like in the middle of this Delta variant kick up thing? And he's like, yeah, nobody fucking here cares, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in the panhandle. He's like, he's in the, like at 30A. Yeah, like Santa Rosa. Wow. And he's like, yeah, no, nobody cares. No he's like, cares. you'll get made fun of if you wear a mask. Like the, the mask shaming is the other way around there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so since we last chatted, Tone's actually seen you guys, the Bourbon yeah. brothers down yeah. in uh, your neck of the woods. So how was that? Yeah. You guys met each other in the flesh. Greg, how was right. it? How was yeah, it was it? great for me. Great for me. <laughs> it's nice when your, your internet friends become your, your real life friends. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a blast. I, uh, my wife and I went down to uh, Savannah for a couple of days in late July, and uh, and we met up and saw the Bourbon Brothers live and in person in Savannah, Georgia. And it was what a thousand degrees, Greg. It was pretty hot. Yeah, it yeah. was uh, hot and sweaty, and it was uh, I think the last week of summer before school for kids. But uh, it was a good time. It's always a good time over there. Go That's a fun cities. town. That's yeah. a fun town. Yeah. First time uh, we'd been there, and and it was it was cool to you know 
it, this is such history and you know not all of it's amazing but so the just the old buildings and yeah. the big trees and every every time you walk a block there's a park it's it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool town or or a cemetery yep that's right yep. <laughs> yeah <laughs> tone was that that was your first show since the pandemic right or one of the few, first few i think that was the first yeah that was the second thing i'd seen live cuz uh, Tuan and i had, we saw trawl early july at uh at aura like july 8th or 9th or something like that on friday night in july but that okay. was the first like proper show i went to but then yeah seeing those guys um and the first time i'd like really gone out and ventured out of the state of maine and done something you know fun <laughs> since the pandemic so it was really fun to to meet up with greg and his wife and have a, an awesome dinner the night before we saw you guys play and then see you guys play the next day which uh was just it was just a blast it was a good time and i would tell everybody go check them out if you can i mean it's the bourbon brothers are a fun time and they uh they put on a good show and they're you know lots of fun crowd interaction I, they were you had some regulars that were really giving you guys a you know a hoot here and there and that was a good time <laughs> Yeah, we're not sure if we're the mayors or if uh, some of the uh, regulars are the mayors so a lot of places we play. <laughs> yeah. So how's that stuff going for you guys? Are you still still gigging around? Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, <laughs> we got six shows this week. Damn. Uh, wow. So On tour. Um, well, they're all, well, I won't say all local because one is, uh, like we were in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, like an hour outside of Knoxville last weekend for... What? A gig this weekend is uh, trying to remember without having to pull up the calendar. No, it's in town. Next weekend is south, like two hours south of the city. Nice. Yeah, we're uh, if we can get there and drive home the next day, we're we're in. <laughs> like it, I like it. Or or even uh, drive home the same day. We actually drove home after the uh, the gig last weekend, and uh, Reed, the singer, <laughs> bought the. Uh, the fury wilder fight so we, oh, we, were nice. shouting, we were shouting it at a little phone the whole time like yeah yeah get him come <laughs> that's, that's amazing <laughs> and something you might hear from me with the red Tux game still going in the background so. <laughs> speaking of live music that's uh cool reminiscing about uh, the show you guys were all at in georgia um we were all at a show in maine together your former touring members 311 rolled through Portland, Maine. We saw them outside. Great fucking show. Yeah. And we've been like seeing a lot of shows or trying to slide them in when we can. Um, we're all adults now, so it's not as easy as it used to be, but I can't, I think, I think it's because there was some distance be between seeing shows during COVID that I started to like kind of deep dive a little bit more during the live show and kind of just focus in on lately, the guitarists on their shredding ability, like, holy shit. And maybe it's because of talking with you. It's like, it's a little bit more deep. You're like, Oh shit that guy's up there fucking ripping like Eddie Van Halen, but like, how the fuck does he do that shit? I know someone that does it. I know someone that knows. And I think that guy is Greg. So we're today, we're going to get a shred education, which I got a coin by tone tone coin. That was a good one. Shred, I, told me, I think Twan might have even. Yeah. Oh, was it Twan? I, I think it was Twan. Yeah. yeah. Probably. Nice. Yeah. One, of you nerds. <laughs> one of you nerds. So we thought we'd get you back on and uh, kind of school us on how the hell do you do that shit? Oh man. When uh, yeah. you guys gave me the topic, I was like, oh, man, I, I don't really know. If I knew, I would have wrote better riffs and we'd have had more hits. Oh, I, I think you wrote some pretty good riffs and had some pretty good hits, man. I, you're selling yourself short there. That's for sure. Red Hot Chili Peppers, what hits? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, I mean, Nate, Nate saw... Uh, Pearl Jam a couple times over the last couple of weeks. And he, he put up a, a post on our Instagram page of Mike McCready just soloing. It's like, Oh man, we need to know more about how this happens. How do you, how do you do that? Like we've got questions. So we've got some questions for you, Greg, regarding, uh, you know, how do you, how do you come up with it? Where, how did you start doing it? Why did you fall in love with playing guitar? All that fun stuff. All right. I'm ready. Even though I had this whole thing planned with playing through, uh, this, uh, uh, amp and, and, uh, plugging it into the zoom and uh didn't work out <laughs> i know that we will do that at some point though we yeah. definitely we definitely want to do that at some point but uh yeah i was gonna play some riffs and be like hey here's how how uh i guess i didn't know how how uh into the into the weeds you guys wanted me to get with uh maybe some like because i can nerd out all day on like music theory gear and just like and uh so yeah i wasn't sure like like how do i do i 
do, how deep do I go here into the theory of say, you know, how, how maybe a riff or, or a solo is going or wh where the key changes are, or, uh, you, you know, just maybe some of the, the effects of how it is or different techniques to soloing. Like you take Eddie Van Halen, right? When, when eruption came out, nobody was really two hand tapping. It was like, he, kind of mind-boggling to people of like what is he playing how is he doing that how is he playing so fast and uh did you know even bef before they were signed he would turn his back to the audience so that nobody could see what he was doing damn and it mm. could not yeah. rip him off it's like a magician and yeah and right and uh like to this day one of the best shows i've ever seen live was uh it was pearl jam at the palladium in LA and it was off the 10 record. Right. And it was still on the way up. Like it hadn't hit its peak height, like height of how big that record got yet. And uh, I, I don't remember the middle band. They were super weird and, and dressed up like spacemen or something. I don't know. They were, <laughs> they were awkward and awful. Um, and everybody sat down, but the first band was this band that nobody knew who the hell they were. And they were recently signed and the record wasn't out yet. And the guitar player is playing stuff and I'm watching him do it. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there are tracks that they're playing to. Is there a DJ off stage? Is this guy really playing this? What? And like, my mind is like, what the fuck is happening right now? How is this possible of the sounds that he's making? And uh, it was Rage Against the Machine. I knew you were going to say that. Yep. Yeah, and, and it was just like wow. the crowd was insane for them. And like, I mean, you're, you're a bunch of 18 year old kids in a sweaty room full of 2,000 other sweaty teenagers, and a guy on the mic shouting, Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> like, yeah. you're going to remember it, even if you've never heard that song before. And like, the whole place was jumping up and down, up and down the whole time. And you know, I, they were throwing out sampler tapes. That's how long ago it was wow. uh, after wow. when they were done playing. And, uh, yeah, just just um, the techniques of how Tom Morello does some of the stuff he did did too is really creative and different and uh, just something new. I, I think he's the last guy th that I would say really did something different and creative mm -hmm. on guitar that was like, what the fuck is that? So let me ask you, like him, is it what's so impressive about him? Because like we're all we're not musicians, but when we hear it, we're like, damn, that sounds amazing. Is it technically challenging to play what he plays or is it the innovation that's so impressive with a guy like I that? I think it's, I think it's the innovation. Yeah. Cause w once you demystify it, you're like, Oh, okay. But he thought that's of it. And that's the now. crazy thing. But, like he thought, yeah. of it, you know, and, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, his, his, uh, you know, the, what he listened to catalog wise and wanted to make a DJ sounds on a guitar and figure out how to do something like that, or just like divine intervention or an accident or like, you know, you just, you know, where inspiration strikes from sometimes. Yeah. Just seeing that just gives you like a different perspective on maybe I'm like personally my own playing like, Oh, like there's rules, but then there's not rules. And uh, like Ed, Eddie Van Halen used, would always say, theory, whatever, you know, technique. At the end of the day, if it sounds good, it is good. And then don't, don't worry about anything. It's just if you like it, play it. If it, you know, if it seems weird to somebody else, it doesn't mean it's like bad. <laughs> so, you know, you, don't, you, you can push the boundaries and keep trying to, to, do new things and play off of other people's ideas, maybe expand on something that they did. You know, there's, there's always something around the corner, but uh, yeah, I guess I was going to like, so I was, I was going to play a bunch of riffs and, and kind of go over theoretically, like what they do. So I was going to take like, if you can think of the, the intro to hot for teacher would yep. be uh, the tapping and begin. If you break those, the, the arpeggio down, the first one is an A minor arpeggio, even though he's tapping it. The next one goes to a D, then it goes to a D minor. But every every section that he's tapping, 
it's really just the root notes in a chord. And so you take the chord and you are arpeggiate it. And then instead of arpeggiating it with picking it, he's tapping it. It gives it a completely different sound, even though it's still the same three fucking notes. Wow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes you can take chords and just build a riff on three chords, like back in black. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. How simple is that? But how right. fucking cool is that riff? Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's an all time. Like riff. everybody knows it. Everybody knows right? it. Yeah, exactly. And then I was trying to think of some more arpeggiated ones, like Sweet Child of Mine. It's really just a play on D, and then he rotates the bass note around on it. So he, he, he's still playing those three notes, do 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 right? It's, it's all D. And then the next note, do 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 So that bass note just changes every time. And Slash, I read an article that when Slash wrote that riff, he actually wrote it as a finger exercise and he was just playing it in band practice one day and everybody was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What was that? Do that again? Yeah. <laughs> He's we like, what? This. He's like, no, man, it sounds like a calliope. I don't know. What is, this is not a tar riff. I wrote this to be a, like a finger exercise. Everybody else is like, no, 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 no. we're going to make a song out of this. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so they, well. they, they built the song around that riff. <laughs> but uh, another riff that works the same way that's, it's uh, arpeggiating a chord, but then they change the bass line. Uh, What's My Age Again? Blink is another really good example of, of like, you're just playing the root notes in a chord, and then you change the bass note every time. So oh, I think yeah. about that one. Yeah. Do, 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 Damn do, it, do, you're do, right. Do. It's, it's the same. It's just one chord, and they just change. You put four different bass notes on it. I already love this because mm. it's stuff that I don't think about, but I know you know it because you've done it. Like, it's... Yeah, and your ear is musical for that reason. You know, like that's something that you bring a different perspective than than I do. Anyway, you Highland, um, I've heard that riff forever. I never heard that part or that part kind of highlighted. Yeah, to the yeah, surface. Yeah, until you mentioned it's, it. that it's really yeah. just one chord. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Um, here, one chord riff. I was trying to think of like a, just a straight up one chord riff. Foxy Lady, Jimi Hendrix. Dun, 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 dun. This is one chord. Wow. <laughs> and then it has that little chromatic clamp. Do, 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 do. And then back to the one chord. Dun, 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 dun. Damn. Oh, but man. another, again, right? Mm. Such yeah. a cool riff. Yeah, yeah. You're just like playing, you're, you're, you're playing the one note, but you're changing it up enough. But then it's, I mean, you go back to a song like that or even What's My Edge Again, and it's such an iconic sound or Back in Black, such a, an iconic sound that you don't even think that it's, it's not simple per se because somebody had to come up with it and put it put it down correctly, but it's more simple than maybe I I had ever thought. Right, especially when it's just it's like a normal chord. It's not like something that's super intricate or like it's something that within like a month or two, if you're playing guitar and somebody showed you the riff, you could probably play it. Like uh, Green Day's Brain Stew. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, then, then, uh, it's like that. Then, uh, I could play that in my scale, sleep, right? but I don't play. Dun, uh, yeah. Dun, uh, yeah. Uh, so, brain stew, right? Yeah. The first time we heard, uh, gosh, damn, we used to play with them all the time before they got signed, and then they had this was their first song, um, Papa Roach. Right. Now, now think of brain stew underneath that. <laughs> yeah, that the the chord progression in the Papa Roach song, it's it's in a different key, but it's it's the same chord progression mm-hmm. theoretically, just shifted over to a different modulated to a different key. Do you hear that a lot? Yes. Like me, I never my wildest dreams would I've connected those two songs. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, Justin used to call them on it because we we used to trade <laughs> shows with them. Yeah. Um, like they because they were from Sacramento, and we would they would come down and open for us in Orange County, and and uh, we would go up there to open for them, and you know play play in front of their home crowd. So like we knew each other before we were both signed, and. Uh, I guess we had a good enough relationship too. We could give some shit like that. Like, bro, you just ripped off brains too, man. That's amazing. <laughs> nice. 
And I mean, look at look at them now. <laughs> it's still going. And that song was massive. Yeah, it was a huge hit. Is it, he's on a the supposed to the singer's on a new name now, right? <laughs> well, he was Kobe he's, Dick he's, there for a while, right? But and that that was what he started with, right? Jacoby Shaddix. Jacoby Shaddix. And then, right? Shaddix, yeah, Shaddix, and then Shaddix, I think he's something yeah. else now. Is he? It's like oh, how many? Man. Yeah, I think so. Like it's like a uh, uh, P Diddy. <laughs> well, and I was gonna say uh, Big Baby Buddha, and uh, who was he? Who was he before that? And uh, R- was it Rizzo that changed his name to that? Old Dirty Bastard, Big Baby Jesus, Old Dirty Bastard, oh, Big, yeah, Big, yeah, yeah. Big Baby Jesus, Big Baby Jesus, Oh man, and the simple context of um, the riff is really interesting because it's kind of like a corporate chime, right? Like AT and T or back in the day, singular, there's always that little like three right. note thing that kind of like circulates in your head. So I guess you're ding, saying, ding, ding. Yeah. yeah. So like the slash riff, sweet, is it sweet child of mine you were talking about? It's just like the, th- yeah. you can kind of build off something like that, which is like a mistake basically. And a band can kind of use that as a core progression or like a basis for a song starting from something simple as just a three note tune. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's more than three notes in any Ramon song. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> no, now that I'm hearing them in my head, you're right. <laughs> I know. Right? Now, now I'm like, natural professional. <laughs> right. The, I guess the beginning of sedated is just that's just one chord. Dun 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 dun. dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and now that I hum that out loud, it's it's the was the '80s song with the two brothers and the glasses. Dun, 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 oh, dun, the proclaimers, dun, dun. The proclaimers. proclaimers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Five hundred uh, miles. Yeah, so you know, I wouldn't say wrist wrists don't necessarily need to be complicated. Um, I, I guess you know, solos can be more complicated, especially if you like delve deep into like Ingve Malmsteen or something. But I, I always find that like you know, whether it's Ingve Malmsteen or or Rush or I don't know, you know some prog rock band that's playing you know, some shit that really only other musicians really like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like at the, at the end of the day, like I always found like for solos for me, I would always want a part to be like technically challenging for me to play or interesting. And then there always has to be a part that, you know, there's no vocals there, right? Over, over solo over over the riff or anything so when it comes to what you're playing when your instrument whether it's a you know piano or horn or guitar like you become the singer at that point and and the spotlight's on you and nobody's really going to walk away from the show humming (laughs) right they they, want to they want to walk away with a melody so like you you still got to give them a something they can sing along to or hum to or or some something that they can grab onto that 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 catches them um there's still got to be like a a catchy i don't want to say simple part but there's got to be a catchy part attached with the complicated part otherwise you're just complicated and right. like uh, people not less, the, less the people masses, into it. Yeah. yeah, people people aren't necessarily into that unless you're like really into whatever instrument that is. Like right. you, you can be Victor Wooten at that point, you know. Right. right. But well, no, yeah, I, I doubt times, half the people listening even know who Victor Wooten is, <laughs> even though he's probably the best player on the pl- base base best bass player on the planet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it, it's you you said something that kind of piqued my interest. It, it's similar when you're probably writing these you know, in the studio to bring, you want to bring somebody into a song and it doesn't usually, it doesn't always start with, you know, vocalist. It starts with, here's the riff. Like, this is what, this is what's going to get you hyped to, oh man, this song's awesome. I remember this song. I'm super stoked to hear it because you get that like early riff to start and then it jumps into everything else. So you, you have to be cognizant of that, whether you're playing it live or whether you're, uh, you're writing it to, to put on record, I would think. Yeah. You know, every band's different. But I will say for Zebrahead, 99 times out of 100, the music was written and usually completed before vocals came in. Yeah. Um, very, very rarely did the vocals start up the idea of the song for us. And uh, if the music wasn't interesting, 
we either kept changing it or just moved on to something else and tried something else. You know, I, I, and I know, you know, other people write differently. Other people don't necessarily write collaboratively either um, as a band. They might be like one or two guys write the songs and just bring it in for everybody and be like, here's what you play. Here's what you play. Here's what you play. You can make up your own stuff. (laughs) 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 But, uh, you know, it just depends on the band. Like you you guys said you had uh, Nick from All American Rejects and and, uh, it was either him or, uh, geez, I'm brain farting on singer's name. Tyson. Um, Oh, no, Tyson's a No, Tyson. Yeah, Tyson. Yeah, it was them that wrote the songs and the other two guys didn't write a whole lot. So, you know, it's just, every band's different. Yeah. So take the solos. Does that, I would think for someone who, you know, played saxophone growing up, I would think solos stem from us, like knowing scales. Did, how, how much does that play into it? Definitely. So when I started playing guitar, the first teacher I had, she taught me from a, a, a Mel no, God, I want to say Mel Brooks, but you know, as I get yeah, older, I can't, I can't believe how much I can't remember things anymore where I'm like, I can picture exactly what I'm talking about. And it's, I had the tip of my tongue and it's like uh, right there, Mel. If it was Mel Brooks. Music. We could talk, I could talk baseballs with you all night. Saddles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right? Mel Robin Bay. Hood men in tights. <laughs> <laughs> Mel Bay book is okay. what it was. It's a good thing Google remembers these things because I, I, <laughs> the older I get, I'm like that thing with the other Jesus. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, thanks, <laughs> thanks AI. <Yeah. laughs> the sooner I can get assimilated into the Borg, the better for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So it was, and the Mel Bay books are very like you're gonna learn standard notation. It's gonna teach you Mary had a little lamb or or Ave Maria and like the first books. And you know, when I was eleven and I picked up a guitar, I was like, I just want to learn Van Halen songs. What what do we what is this garbage? (laughs) (laughs) And uh and she's like, Yeah, you just gotta we we gotta get there before you can, you know, you gotta walk 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 before you can run, sort of thing. Right. And I'm like, ah and uh I eventually got fed up when I met some friends at school and they're like, Oh, you should try my guitar teacher. So we, he just teaches me Van Halen songs, Iron Maiden. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's what I want to do. Let's do that. And that's like, the smart guitar teacher right there. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I want to, I want to go to that guy. Where would give me his, where do I, where do I go? Is there, so I went over and took a lesson with this other guy, Larry Sampson, Fuller music. He's still, uh, he's still teaching music there too at a mom and pop music shop that I can't believe is still in business 40 years later. But uh, yeah, it's still there, still in downtown Fullerton where I grew up. And Larry's still teaching there. And uh, when I went in for my first lesson there, and you know, it was like the trial lesson and see if you're going to sign up for more. He had a Van Halen backstage pass on his wall. I was like, oh, Van Halen. He's like, I wouldn't say no, but I met him one time, you know, backstage. He's like, you like Van Halen? I'm like, and then we talked about Van Halen for like 10 minutes. And he's like, well, you know, I could just teach you Van Halen songs if that's what you want to do. But wouldn't it be a lot cooler if I taught you how to think like Van Halen and you could write your own solos and write your own songs and you could be your own Van Halen? And wow. I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> what? This guy, this guy knew how to pitch, man. He knew how to pitch. <laughs> he locked you into like a three-year deal right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I want to so, learn guitar right now, and I'm 37. <laughs> sounds like a pyramid scheme. You want to be a millionaire tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Here are the tips and tricks. <laughs> Cutco is your future. <laughs> yeah, so he had, uh, uh, we, yeah, pretty much immediately shifted to, you know, he taught me a Van Halen song. <laughs> but then we got into immediately music theory and scales and uh, modes and just learning how to solo, I guess, for lack of a more, more descriptive word, but just learning to play your own thing and uh, how it fits together. And, and, you know, if, if you're, 
I'm not sure about how it works necessarily on say sax, but for the most part it has some familiarity with piano. Like most people had to play some piano as a kid or something, or had a piano in the house. And, you know, if you, if you learn, you know, key of C is, you know, all the white keys. Right. And then if you go to C sharp, then, you know, you've got the different keys have more of the sharps and flats and then you play the black keys in with it. Right. And so the, the scale, when you look at different scales on your piano, come up a little differently for voice and chords. Guitar, super simple, because it's literally, you learn one scale, and then if you want to play it in another key, you literally just move your key, your indicator for what you're playing to a different fret. So you can just play the same set of notes in the same pattern on a different fret. Like it just starts. Like if, if you had the fretboard, let me grab a guitar. I was going to say it's way above my head. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you had, you had your scale on here, right? You, you could overlay all the notes on here like dots. And it was just a map of what notes to play. And you just want to shift keys from let's say g a uh, well, let's go from c and you want to go to d you just literally move everything up two frets wow. nice. and you want to so you just whatever it's the same pattern it might be different notes but the the shape of what you're playing is all the same so you know it's just a, hand, hand position yeah just yep. put it in a different spot and then when you break down the chord progressions in rock, like we were talking about brain stew versus uh, cut my life into pieces, it may be the same, like theoretically it's the same chord progression, just in a different key. So honestly, <laughs> there's really only about four or five chord progressions in rock music. <laughs> wow. And they're, all, they're all the same. And they talk about one, four, five for rock music, like uh, one, four, five would be the, the root note, right? Or the root chord, then the fourth note in the scale and then the fifth note. So a song like that would be Louie Louie is one, four, five. Da, na, na, da, na, da, na, na, okay. na, it's one, four, five, a uh, wild thing. Da, na, thing. Da, na, da, na, and you make my heart sing. Da, na, 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 na. You know, like, there's, there's really there's literally like less than half a dozen probably of the chord progressions in rock. And once you've seen them all and you just got to know to put them in a different key. And so, you know, BB King used to talk about, you know, what advice do you have for young guitar players? And he would always say, yeah, learn how to play in different keys. Just mm -hmm. don't get locked in a, I can play blues and a minor because, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to go jam with somebody they might play the same song, but maybe they play it in B minor. Or you get older like Chuck Berry, and you can't sing that high anymore, so you modulate everything down that step, and then a step right. and a half as you get older because you can't sing that high anymore. <laughs> Man, so what you're saying is in copy copyright infringement court, the judge at some point is like, well, there's only so much you can do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, what, what you need to do, Greg, I, I, I foresee a new job for you. You could be a copyright yeah. infringement lawyer, and you'd be like, yeah, this is the same as that. Here, yeah. give the guy, the, give the guy <laughs> his money. <laughs> Tom Petty should have sued the Chili Peppers. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Exhibit A, Greg this. has a guitar in court. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> watch, I'd watch that show right now. I'm thinking back to like, I don't know, like 20 years ago. I go to Warp Tour for the first time. Like, I can't imagine the musicians I'm seeing on stage even know about time signatures and chord progressions and keys and things like that. It just, it seems so advanced for a lot of the bands I grew up seeing. I don't know, maybe... I would... I would venture to say that most of those bands probably did not understand any of those. Okay. Things. Yeah. That's <laughs> fascinating to me. I will tell you that I can't tell you how many times I've gone on tour and other guitar players out on tour would be like, what are you playing? How do you do that? And I would be like, do you, do you know your scales? And they're like, no, no, no. I don't, I don't want to learn theory because it might mess with my style. I'm like, I want you to think about that for a second. Now, I want you to picture Shakespeare 
in class with school, whatever the school there was back then, and telling his teacher, you know, I don't really want to learn English, man. It's going to mess with the style, the way I write. I don't, I don't know if it works like that. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't picture Jack Kerouac saying to his college professor, yeah, bro, I don't want you messing up my writing style. I got this thing. It works good for me. I don't need to learn English. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so I would, honestly, they would be like, well, no, I don't. I'm like, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I got surprised for it. And then I would, I would chart things for him. I would write out like pentatonic scales, which is a five note instead of eight note, which is the, the blues, basically some blues scales. And then I would give him, I, I would give it the whole length of the, of the fretboard. And then the way my teacher broke it out for me was he gave them in boxes. So there's five boxes, the, the five boxes interlock into each other. So the, you learn one set, one finger position one week and the next week I come back for a lesson and he'd teach me position two and position, the end of position two fits into the same set of notes as the end of position one, right? So they interlock together until you build out the whole fretboard and see what the whole fretboard looks like. And then then the trouble becomes as I used to read in like guitar magazine as a kid, they'd talk about breaking out of the box when you're playing. So you don't get locked into, you play this position and then you shift over to this one right. to where you can make it smooth and transition between all of the boxes as if there were no boxes and you just, there's a set of notes talking it, it you know, of what you want to uh, convey. I think one of the best exercises my guitar teacher always gave me and encouraged me to do. And I don't know if this could be a thing anymore. I suppose it could be if you put on a playlist because radio is kind of dead industry. Mm -hmm. But he would tell me, just turn on the radio and play along, just solo. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, just play whatever you want over it. I'm like, what if there's already a riff on it? He's like, play your own riff. I'm like, what if there's already a solo going on? Like play your own solo. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So, yeah, I would just turn on KLOS back then or KNEC or whatever, you know, rock stations, and I would just play along to a song and make up my own things or play as if I was in the band and play on the ins and outs of things to where you're like, I'm trying not to trample on the vocals right here, but here's a little spot so I can play right here. <laughs> and, you know, still try and fit in play something that fits with the song while even though it's a song that's already written i just had a flashback i'm in my room i've got one of those little like basketball hoops that connects to your door and oh, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing the whole you know michael jordan three two one and shooting it <laughs> right that's the same thing you're you're playing music all over the radio and trying to like learn how to do what they do but yeah. also your own thing at the same time it's you're just like you're doing the three, two, one in the backyard, but you're doing it with the radio on and a guitar in your head. Yeah. 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 It was definitely like, it's still fun for me to do. Like if, if I've got to learn a, a song for Bourbon brothers and uh, I'm like, I'm really uh, trying to find a chord chart for it. So I don't have to listen because jazz is a little different. And uh, a lot of times, you know, the playlist goes long and then I'll roll into the next song and I'll still, uh, just be playing, playing along like, oh, yeah, this is kind of fun. Oh, key change, missed it. Oh, well, where are we at now? <laughs> uh, okay, okay, we're here. Oh, key just changed back. All right, okay, here we are. <laughs> um, and Reed, Reed go, goes to get a beer, and you're, like, just playing, just, like, buying him time. <laughs> <laughs> I've right? seen that in person. It's fun. That was an extraordinary long one. He too, was gone uh, where, for, like, 15 we minutes. Like, what is it? Is he, did he go to the bathroom? Is he okay in there? Is he having a heat stroke? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do that all the time. Actually, there's been some shows where we played and he's looked over and been like, how long can you drag this out? I'm like, why? <laughs> what do you need? He's like, I got I to gotta shit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, man, we'll make it work. As long as you, you need, man. Thing. As long as you need. <laughs> that explains a lot. 
right? You're coming back shows. though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose you could pull that off at like a fish concert, but I don't know about a blink concert. Right. I know right. the songs are so short. It's like, right. <laughs> Travis, how long can you play the drums for? Yeah, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Unless it's like Gigi Allen, they'd be like, I'll just shit right here. It's cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and throw it at the crowd. Just to be cut. <laughs> Distract the crowd. Guys, I really got to shit. You're, sorry. Sorry to the front row. <laughs> oh, so many questions answered just on that. Keep playing, keep playing. I got to shit. Man, yeah. how many times has that happened that I've seen and didn't know? behind the music way more, way, <laughs> way more than we want to even think about for sure. <laughs> eric clapton keeps going oh it's because the drummer left oh he's got yeah. a shit yeah. <laughs> yeah people i've heard of uh ed the drummer in zebrahead saw sound garden in seattle and the bass player and the drummer were shouting at each other and he couldn't really tell what they were saying because it, it was a big room and you know from the you know middle of the hall and bass player walks off and they just kept playing and bass player never came back <laughs> no, until like okay. the very end and it, they came to find out they like they got a fight they were pissed off he's like fuck you fuck i'm leaving fuck off <laughs> he's wow. off stage <laughs> you play bass i'm playing drums though play both <laughs> that's one instrument you can afford to let them walk <laughs> yeah. depends on the band though yeah, right i, I mean occasionally yeah. <laughs> we've had a lot of great bassists in they have played yeah. a pivotal role in uh, yes. in their we, band. We love yeah, the bass if, player. Yeah, if Pino walks off stage, that's going to be rough. That's you, different. You're like, yeah. oh, now oh. what? <laughs> kind of, he's kind of <laughs> the driver sometimes. <laughs> when you were talking, Greg, about playing to the radio, like I have visions of my favorite musicians and bands not practicing on their own outside of band practice. I just, I just feel like they're already too good. They don't need to practice. Like, are you? Do you practice like when you were in the thick of it or or now, or is it just band practice? So now we very rarely have a band practice for Bourbon Brothers. Our our sets are so long and we play so many times a week now. We're playing three, four, sometimes five or, or more times a week. Like I, I get plenty of playing time in, which is good and bad because uh, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't say that I get to practice. I get to play. And if I want to try new things, then at this point I'm trying them in front of an audience or just going for it, which in part of my mind, I, I heard stories and I forget who the player was in Miles Davis's band. And he was playing something backstage before the show. Miles comes in and he, and he looks at his player. He's like, are you playing such and such song? And he's like, uh, yeah, I don't pay you to fucking practice in here. I pay you to fucking practice on stage in front of fucking people. Yeah. Fuck it. If I ever catch you scripting something in here again or working on something, you're fired. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so like, like Miles Davis wanted his band to be very like, you're jamming. You're on the spot. Yeah. We're, we're this good. We're just going to do it right now. Rock guys, I don't really see any rock guys that are going to, like change play a different solo every night and not have it be and have it be different have it be good have it be you know something phenomenal you know unless it's like the jam se session when you right. get to like clapton or something right but even then if clapton plays crossroads people have been hearing that song for 50 years if he plays the solo different people are going to be like what the fuck? Right. Yeah, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> it's not how it goes in my mind. <laughs> right. It's not how I heard so, it on the record or yeah. Yeah. Right. There, there's a there's a gap for that. And I think rock artists are expected to to have it be very close to, to the record. And the deviations are because they're usually fucked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or they're just not that talented to to recreate it, you know, night after night. Um, right. and perfect right like right. when i was on tour though with with zebrahead like i wake up at the ass crack of 11 right maybe maybe <laughs> 10 yeah. maybe noon depending on how big my i went the night before and uh you know load ins at like two o'clock three o'clock and then 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 you sit around <laughs> and then i've got all my gear out and i'm bored af 
And so I would work on things all the time on tour. I would practice like from the time I unboxed the guitar after load in until like, I'd usually take a break to go do something. But then when the show started, you know, if we're headlining, then when the first band would come on, I would go out and watch the show. And then I would literally, I would sit on the side of the stage with a guitar and I would play along to whoever's set and just do like the same thing with the radio. That's just awesome. Play oh, nice. them. <laughs> but yeah, like earlier in the day I would work on scales and I would, I would create my own like finger exercises to, to work on things and, and get better. Um, when I was younger, I would study more, more theory and try and learn like more exotic scales um, that weren't just, you know, major minor, major minor pentatonic, you know, uh, uh, let's see, melodic minor or harmonic minor. I would try and learn alternate tunings. So like Keith Richards, Rolling Stones, probably something that if you're a guitar player, you don't know. All his guitars are tuned to open G and he, he isn't playing standard tuning. So he, he has different voicings for like, if I were to play a chord, the same chord that he would play, he was fretting entirely different notes. And it has wow. a bunch of open notes to it too. So it has like a different, a different vibe to it. Like it just a, it's different, cooler, uncooler. It's just if you like that open tuning or not. Right. Mm -hmm. And then every open tuning. So uh, this, they're probably way out of tune because I haven't done it in a while in here, but uh, yeah, it's not in tune, but this one is open E. Uh, this one is drop D. This one is a half step down. That one's standard. This one should be dad gad. So for our listeners, Greg has a wall of guitars, and he's just yep. uh, you know, showing us each one of them. Tune, <laughs> tune to different spots, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can tune them to different things, and, and even if you're playing the same chords, it sounds a little different. Like, let's try to think of a Seabird song. Uh, Blur. Blur was a, a song that is in open E and I was playing around with a tremolo pedal and God, I forget the name of the song, but the band was, uh, it was a song by a band called big wreck and they had done a riff that was very similar to, uh, that was the, the Smith song. Uh, is that yeah. here is now where basically what you do on, on the tremolo pedal is you, you, put the rate you open the rate and grab a pedal <laughs> I, lo I love this tour of the of the studio right now <laughs> yes yeah, so you, you put the depth all, all the way up at, at full and then the rate will be how fast you want it to go but if you put the depth at full it'll open and close to where it it kind of bottoms out like it has that like emptiness so it, it gives it like that stutter almost Mm -hmm. to it and uh this other band did it and i was like oh you know that smith song is so cool and i don't know if they're gonna rip it off i'm gonna rip it off too Fuck it. <laughs> yeah how can i and then i wanted to tweak it so it wasn't so like i'm ripping off fucking johnny mark <laughs> 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 i wanted to make it i wanted to hide my my theft a, a little better so uh i i had a i had a riff and then i had it in open e and so I, I kind of built that riff around. I wanted to do what that other band did, but ripping off the, the you know, the Johnny Marr riff, but then kind of my, make it my own. So. Well, you did a good that, job. You did a good job <laughs> right. because I, I've heard both songs a million times and I didn't think of it until you just said it. So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, 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 that song too, that's another one. Da, 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 it's just it's pretty simple chords and then it gets into the 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 verse plays back into that the beginning the, part right the beginning the riff, riff yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i can hear it in my head i can hear so, it in my head too so when the question i had and and it was it kind of goes back to the the solo writing solos i guess maybe globally and also for you when you're getting ready to go out on tour do bands write a guitar solo they're going to use every night in a certain spot or do you just kind of freelance it that night with what you're feeling? I would say Fish probably freelances it that yeah. night of what they're feeling. I would say 
Slayer plays the same solo. Stick to the night. script. Yeah. 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 I I played my solos pretty much note for note on the record. However, there were a couple that I even in the studio, I was just kind of like, I just give me another pass. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I don't I don't know what's gonna happen, but yeah, okay, that one's cool. And then I would kind of intentionally keep it to where I would try and play something different every night. But what would happen is by the end of the tour, I would fall into a groove of like, oh, I like where this started. And then I would keep that. And then the next day I would build on that to something else. And I was like, oh, I like how it ended. And then, then, then you're like filling in the middle and then you would keep parts of different days. And then it, by the end of the tour, I was playing a completed thought. <laughs> That's exciting. Do you end up using that like down the road, like for something else? Did do you, does something come out of that sometimes? Uh, for me, I, I can't think of a time when it happened. However, I will tell you that if on Van Halen, if you listen to the end of Jump, Eddie plays this riff at the end of the song on guitar that goes dun 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 in the as the song is fading out right and then 10 years later and sammy hagar is singing and top of the world was the song and that's the the riff in the song it's dun 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 i was like wait a minute hold on <laughs> and i had to go back and listen to it and i was like sure enough yeah it's the same riff <laughs> he just put it put it in another song and built a song around it i was like oh cool it's like cool for fans to hear something like that. Now I'm going to go back and listen to that. I know. Right? <laughs> like all these songs I'm going to go back and listen to with a, with a different ear. And yeah. I guess that's maybe a question I just thought of is like, we're all sports nerds here. And in sports, there's objective metrics of how good someone is like DJ LeMayhew batting champion with guitar. Like, how do you know if someone's good? Like we're an untrained ear, everything sounds good to us. But how do you know? Like, how, how do you know someone's a virtuoso? Ooh, I uh, I guess you know it's it's. I would go back to the the Eddie Van Halen thought on that. Like, if you like it, it's good. It uh, you know, w with sports, it's it's competitive. You know, there's a, a clear cut winner at the end of the game. Right. I, I guess unless you're in mid season in hockey, you can have a tie. <laughs> or, <laughs> but I guess you can have a tie in football too, right? Yeah. Yep. But it, it, I won't say who in our band in Zebrahead, but some people would get mad at other bands' success with the being irritated that we all collectively thought they sucked. <laughs> <laughs> we can relate but, to that in but, a different but way they, <laughs> but they get a hit and then you're like those motherfuckers <laughs> right yeah, they did it <laughs> <laughs> right but you know i was like i would always tell them it's it's not a competition man it's a it's a brotherhood and uh you know what's what's good for them is good for us too so it's let's you know let's let's lift each other up rather than uh make this a, a, a competition about like who's better at, at music. Cause I feel like music is, it's, it's personal. It's, it's more, more subjective, you know, it's, everybody's going to have their own opinion. Like, uh, um, I, I'm sure my wife would not appreciate Slayer in the slightest, just like, I don't really get Ellie Goulding. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but both great in their own right. But, yeah, but exactly. <laughs> And that's that's kind of the best part about music. You're right. It's everybody has their own opinion, and there are bands that bring people together, and there are bands that you, you kind of go into your own direction. But you can you can respect that that the people like that over there. You, it may not be for you, but you can respect that. Yeah, and you know, I always felt that like I don't know. For me personally, music was always music was always so special to me that I was a super nerdy kid growing up, fat pimples like. I was a dork. <laughs> and uh, uh, a lot of times, you know, my, my guitar was my best friend. You know, I was hanging out in my room by myself playing guitar. And uh, like, it always listened to me. <laughs> it never shit on me. Like, it was, it was never mean to me. It never took my lunch money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, and 
I just felt that music was always like something to express yourself with. It was, you know, it was a, a shoulder to cry on or, or, uh, you know, your cheerleader in your corner or honestly, in my case, it, it was always my Dumbo's feather. Like, I, I don't know if I would venture out of the house ever if, if I didn't play guitar. I damn sure wouldn't ever kiss a girl if I didn't play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's why I was, was like, it's, it's not really, a, you know, it's not a competition. It's like, it's personal to everybody. And, and a lot of times I always thought this was special about Zebrahead. And, I, and I, I would see it with other bands sometimes too, not all the time, but you know, you, you get people that travel to follow a band and then the, the, a community builds around the, the music that you created mm-hmm. and, uh, and they become friends that would have never been friends or in the band oftentimes becomes friends with these people that are fans and they become fan friends or just friends after time and, you know, coming to shows so often and hanging out together. And there's a lot of good times attached to that. And, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times like people would put like three CDs in front of me to, to autograph after a show. And somebody asked me, which one's my favorite. And I was turning around and asked them, I'm like, which one's your favorite? Oh, hold on. Actually, let me guess. And then I would look at them. I would look at the albums and, and try and try and kind of guess their age and figure out when like their prime hangout years with their friends are. Yep. Yep. And, oh, uh, nice. And whatever, whatever record I thought timeline would coincide with what that would be, that would be my pick. And it would always be right. And, oh, wow. I, and I, I guess music is often the soundtrack to our lives. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And in, in, in so many ways, whether it's good or bad or, you know, the a breakup a shitty time, a, a friend dying, a parent dying or happy times, weddings, parties, like college, you know, going out with, with your buddies or a, a baseball game or a, a tour trip or a trip to go see a band play or, you know, and uh, this it's, there's so many feelings wrapped up in, in it and to, to make it like a special for, you know, everyone. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to, you know, I never felt like it was a competition, like who's best or who's better. Or, like there's just people that are, I think are good at, at making music. Some people are good at making music, but not technically proficient at making music. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will say like, like Blink. Outside of Travis, the other two guys, like Mark Hoppus, not a spectacular bass player. Catchy fucking songs though. Like, does it make yeah, his right. music? Does it? Yeah. Does it taint his music that he's not a Victor Wooten on bass? Right. Uh, I don't think so. No, right. You're right. <laughs> yep. Totally. Man. So that uh, that kind of got us thinking. I mean, you, you know, it's not a competition, but you must have favorites, like favorite solos. Any stand out that are just your favorite. Of mine personally, or just like in general? Of yours, personally. Of mine personally. The HMP solo, I I, uh, I like a lot. Expectations, I like a lot. Feel This Way, I, I like a lot. Mm. Uh, almost want to feel like I got to open up our catalog to <laughs> look at <laughs> look at the songs and, and try to remember. I, I, the, the riff and blur is one of my favorite riffs that that I ever wrote. That's a cool one. That is an awesome um, one. Uh, Someday and uh, Mental Health solos were really cool. I just thought they were like a, a cool tangent. They're very similar, but like a, a cool change of pace from what the rest of the song was doing to go in a different direction. Nah, I mean, I'd, I'd have to, I, th- I think I'd have to open up <laughs> CDs to right. figure out more from, from me. Um, there's some of my favorite so many. solos of like other people though, all along the watchtower, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Uh, that solo is awesome because it has, ev- it has everything that I want. Like when I talked about, like it has complicated technical stuff, but my favorite part in the solo is when he gets, he gets to the halfway point and he s- steps on his wall and he's just playing the the he's playing like a chordy sort of thing in the, towards the end and 
And it's just like, oh, it just, it opens up and comes into this catchy little melodic part before it, you know, out of the shredding. When you're just like, oh, yeah, right here. Nice. <laughs> Van Halen, Hang Em High, the, the song's probably, unless you're a deep cut Van Halen fan, <laughs> probably not familiar with Hang Em High on Diver Down. Um, but the solo in that has a very similar, like, same idea like it shreds in the first half and then towards the end it's got this um, part that, that plays where it's just like it opens up and simplifies and this is really cool obviously eruption i even thought uh, you know cathedral is arguably maybe more cool to me than eruption was because I guess at the time when Eruption came out, I I didn't get into Van Halen until 1984 when I was that came out in '83 and I was 12. Um, so when Van Halen one came out, I was 77 or 78. I was five or six. I didn't I didn't I didn't listen to it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so I didn't I didn't understand the uh, the tapping. By the time I started playing guitar, everybody and their mom was tapping and ripping them off, and uh, so I didn't necessarily understand the ingenuity of it but the uh playing cath- cathedral was really cool of like what the fuck is he doing how did he do that that's not a normal sound a guitar is supposed to make so c- cathedral is really awesome i you know i love so many of van halen solos it's hard to pick like one of my favorite favorite van halen solos <laughs> yeah yeah like the songs themselves you know hot for teachers awesome song especially when you're a 12 year old boy and you, the video is amazing. Right. right. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yes, sir. I, you know, I recently saw one of those, like, where are you, are they now sort of things scroll through my feed. And it was the teacher from hot from teacher. It's like, what is she doing now? Is she still like, is she a 60 year old smoke show? And uh, yeah, she's like a 60 year old dance instructor. And she, she's smoking hot. If you're in a 60 year old. Amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, you heard it first. Yeah. She she's still she's still teaching dance. She's a teacher and she's teaching dance. To bring it full circle, your music teacher's still teaching out there in California. So <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I yeah, it's like uh, what's what's Stacy's mom up to now? Yeah, good, good, yeah. good question. <laughs> Stifler's mom. Yeah, Stifler's mom. What's, what's Stifler's mom doing? Oh, she's was, an Stif- actress, yeah. right? was it St- was it Stifler's mom in that video? No, I don't know. It could have been, no. right? <laughs> I'm trying to remember who was in that video. Was it a star? Was it a celebrity? I don't was think Stacey's it was her. Mom? Yeah, I don't think it was her. It might have been a star, but I don't think it was her. Lady on the uh, cover of uh, Enema of the State. What's she up to these days? Right. She was a porn star. Oh, was she Jenna, like Jenna. Janice or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. I can. She's probably yeah. in her like 70s now, 60s. I know that's 20 something years, 24 years ago. So. <laughs> wow. Janine. I was, oh, uh, the, the yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> well, I think that's a good spot right there to to wrap the uh, the shred education for tonight. I know there's more on the bone there. We can always come back to that, and we really, really appreciate. First off, you introing the episode tonight, Greg, and yeah. then sharing with us your technical ability and your uh, your expertise and knowledge of of the guitar. Man, it's it's been a blast to talk to you again. Yeah, Greg, we really appreciate it. We we love having you on. Oh, no problem. When we yeah. come back, is that long oh, enough we'll, to cut it into two? We'll do it again. No, but we'll do it again. I mean, yeah, this would be one, but yeah. you're you're coming back. We've yeah, I mean, you're yeah. you're you're the de facto fourth member, right? We've had we've had others, but you're you are definitely the <laughs> yeah. most comfortable in that chair, and we love it. Yeah. All right, that's gonna do it tonight. Uh, thank you everybody for listening, checking us out. Uh, if you had a guitar riff that you absolutely love, hit us up. Uh, hit us up on social media. Hit us up on Twitter and DMs, or uh, you know anywhere on our social media platforms at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Gmail, uh, Patio Slave Podcast at Gmail dot com. Peace, potheads. Peace.